morning, Jesus Image family. You guys, I just feel like we should just close our eyes and enter in. Jesus, we're so expectant that you're gonna come this morning, Lord. Jesus, we come in humility, Lord. God, we are nothing without you, Jesus. We are nothing without you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you for your body, Lord. Jesus, forgive us for coming in, Lord. Just complacent, Jesus. Lord, we come in with reverence this morning, God. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand, Jesus. In James, it says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Jesus, we lift you up this morning, Lord. Jesus, be lifted high, be lifted high in our hearts. Be lifted high in this place, Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we worship this morning, God, that we would get so lost in you, Jesus, that every distraction would go in the name of Jesus, that we would glorify you with everything that we are, Lord. Have your way this morning, in Jesus' name, amen.
day. I put off all my heaviness and I put on this garment of praise. Cause you turn my morning into dancing. You turn my night into day.
You're worthy of everything, Lord. You're worthy of it all. Of it all. I pray that you are glorified and lifted up and that there is a sweet-smelling aroma coming from this place today that pleases your heart, Lord. That it moves your heart. We thank you. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your death, burial, resurrection, for your ascension, for your enthronement. We thank you, Jesus, that you are coming back to rule and reign one day, Jesus. We are thankful for everything about you. We are thankful. So I pray, Jesus, that that is our hearts. That is who we are through and through today as you are loved and you are adored. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we just thank the Lord? Thank him. Seal it with your praise by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Worthy to be praised. In your precious, beautiful name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You guys can find your way back to your seats. Why don't we thank the choir and the worship team as they make their way back to their seats as well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We get to step into an amazing time of giving in these next few moments. But before we do, um, I have a couple things quickly that I'm going to share. Number one is Jesus School is rapidly approaching soon. You guys excited? I know we have some students in here, some that are already coming and moving their families across the nation, across the world, getting rooted and planted. And so we're super excited about that. I am just like Jess. I am biased when it comes to one of the greatest ministry schools in all of the planet. I know it. I've been in the room and I have seen his looked into his eyes and felt the hunger that's in the room and experienced absolutely transformational uh, presence. And so we want to encourage you guys, if you guys want to um, apply, we have all the information up on the screens. We are now open to international students as well. So yeah, come on, you guys excited? So listen, all that's going to do, the furnace is just going to get turned up. The fire is just going to get bigger. I promise you, man. These We get to interview them, Amy and myself, and just to see the hunger and the anticipation. Some of them have been waiting for years just to get in the room. So listen, if you guys, if you guys could be in Texas or you can be in Uganda, if you want to apply and come to Jesus School, I want to encourage you guys, get up there, ask the Lord. If you feel that little tug in your heart like many of us did, Go for it. As well as House of Bethany, we want to encourage you guys as well. Yeah, come on. House of Bethany students, you guys are in the room. You know, obviously, you know, we have many tracks within House of Bethany as far as vocals and, and music and, and media and dance and a bunch of others. But important, more importantly is that we get to hear from fathers, mothers, Pastor Michael and Jess, Pastor Benny, on what it looks like to truly minister to the heart of the Lord to be ministers to him. We all may have a grace and a gift to worship him, but it's to actually have the heart, to actually have the heart of worship and what it really looks like to, to love Jesus with all that we are. And so we want to encourage you. Obviously, you, you have to be a, a first or second year student if you want to apply, but you can also be an alumni uh, for House of Bethany as well. And so we have all that information up there. You guys can sign up, and we'll see you this fall. We're super excited. So you guys ready to give this morning? Amen. If you guys want to open your Bibles, the Holy Scriptures to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. This is a good one. But it says, send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. It says, when clouds are heavy and the rains come down, whether a tree falls north or south, it stays where it falls. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they will never reap a harvest. So I pray this morning that we are not ones, listen, we're all farmers in here. We may not be planting broccoli and cauliflower, 
but we do have seeds in our hands. And so I want to encourage you guys that we don't look at the clouds or the rain, but we look at the cross. That we actually look at the cross this morning. Because looking at the clouds, the distractions, look at, we have a, a million reasons why we probably shouldn't give this morning or think we shouldn't give. But there is one huge reason why we should. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he has given everything to us. I pray as we give this morning, we remember the gospel. The gospel is alive to us today. I pray that, you know, as we give to him and him alone, that we will see the cross, that we will see the offering. Listen, there is a lady in Matthew chapter 26 that we know Mary at Bethany. She gave a, an expensive, you know, perfume and gift, and Jesus forever ties it to the gospel. He says, I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel may be preached in all of the world, he says, this lady's one good deed will be forever remembered and it will always be discussed, I mean, talked about. Just think the gospel is being preached all throughout the world this morning. And this lady's one act, this immoral woman, Mary's one act of worshiping him with actually an offering will be forever tied to her. So I pray this morning that we don't look at the clouds because the clouds will restrict you. But I pray we see the cross because it will truly liberate you in this act of giving and in these next few moments. So I pray that we look at him. So let's just bow our eyes or bow our heads, close our eyes. <laughs> And let's look at Jesus. You can bow your eyes too, I guess. Your eyelids do bow. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we see you. We look to you in these moments. I pray that we see the cross, the cross that liberates us in giving, because you are the offering. We give our offering, but we give it to the offering, capital O. You were the sacrificial offering, Jesus. So we give directly into your hands today. And I pray that you bless every giver. I pray that it does come back to them in due season like Ecclesiastes says. It. It'll come back into their lives, Father. But I pray we have that heart posture of love giving into your hands and that we remember the gospel this morning. We see the cross in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you guys need an envelope, you guys could just lift your hands. We have ushers throughout the room. We have our text to give number that we put up there. And as well as you guys watching online, there is one on the bottom of your screen as well. So we just want to encourage you guys to give. We're going to bring the buckets up. You guys can come up and give into the hands of Jesus this morning.
please? Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Come on, let's just look to Jesus. Lord, we love you. We honor you. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord. We give you all the praise. All the glory belongs to you forever and ever and ever. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just fill this room with your presence, that you would speak to us and strengthen us in your word, and that many hearts would be drawn to you, that many bodies would be healed, that as we receive communion this morning, that the life of God would flood our bodies, our hearts, our minds. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your presence. You are the treasure and you are the reward. And thank you for the privilege of being here with you this morning and with each other as your body. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Would you love on a few people and then take your seats? Just find a few people. It's always dangerous. Uh, it usually turns into a testimony or a long conversation. All right. That was enough time to hug three. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, I miss the students. You guys are too tamed for my, my taste. Good morning. OK. Students, come back early. We'll start summer sessions. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful morning, a wonderful day today. Our uh, very close friends from around the country are flying in. Uh, tonight, and our board uh, will be here this evening. Actually, Pastor Paul Teske is already here. Can we welcome Pastor Paul? And uh, he's going to help me with communion at the end of service, and that will be powerful and anointed in Jesus' name. Amen. We, uh, a few things, we just finished our, with our staff and some of our worship team a 24 hour prayer vigil. Uh, on the land that we are building on. It was so powerful, and uh, I'm actually waiting to get some feedback and time to take some testimonies from the team privately. But for me, it's become like, I think probably the favorite thing we get to do in the ministry. Um, we get to meet in that home on the church property, and it's really become a holy, holy place. I mean, you walk in, and the peace of God is there. I mean, it's tangible on that land. I, we've had the privilege of hosting multiple uh, leaders in the body of Christ there. Uh, Steph has been there twice. Lindy and her family stayed there. Um, gosh, Christy Brent had the joy of, you know, Brian passed the year before last. They started circuit riders together. How many of you remember the Sunday they were here with us? She had an encounter with the Lord at the cross um, where the Lord really spoke to her. We have what we believe is something close to the life size accurate measurements of the cross. If you trace these measurements back uh, to uh, the early church, uh, we did our best to try to, uh, as accurately as possible, build something that would be uh, uh, close to what the Lord's cross would have been. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It's, the cross is surrounded with a, a, a gorgeous rose garden now, and there's obviously the sign on the top of the cross that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And then there's a scripture at the base of the cross that says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And There are chairs that are in a semicircle around the cross, and just to watch people go sit out there in the mornings, friends of ours, and have encounters with God has been a dream come true. Uh, my brother had an encounter with the Lord out there where the Lord spoke to him, and I've had many. And to make it better, there are bass in the pond near, near the cross. So it doesn't get much better for me, but we just completed that prayer vigil. And speaking of the land, we break ground this week. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. And... Uh, yeah, what a dream. Um, well, there won't be any shortage of tears uh, at the groundbreaking. And uh, so honored. Uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick's driving in just to, to be there. Uh, and others, uh, obviously our board and Pastor Benny and my parents. And uh, I know Brian Guerin's flying down just to be there. Just 
I'm, I'm in awe uh, of, of uh, just the Lord's blessing over us. Amen. Uh, Keith Wheeler's here. Keith, would you stand? This is my dear friend, Keith. He carries the cross around the world. <laughs> Keith, how many, how many nations have you, could you remain standing? How many nations have you carried the cross in now? A lot. A lot. <laughs> have you kept count? How many? More than 185. 185 <laughs> nations of the world. <laughs> Love to have you here. Thank you. It's a, it's a joy and privilege. All right, let's get straight into the scriptures. And for those of you in Southern Cal, we are coming July the 28th. Register and register soon. I'm sure it's filling up very quickly. We will be in the next leg of the Jesus Tour. And um, we're using Pastor Jensen Franklin's uh, church there at Free Chapel. So if you're anywhere near the West Coast or anywhere, you're just hungry for God, come. And the pastor's conference is right around the corner in the fall. Can we put that up, that graphic up? Yeah. So uh, we've added Francis and... Um, that's going to be very powerful. And if you're wondering or hungry to see churches built by the Lord and in the Lord and sustained by the Lord, we want to invite you pastors from around the world, church leadership teams, uh, children's church, you name it, whatever, missionaries, musicians, come, come and be in the presence of the Lord. For me, uh, as I've said many times, the most glorious worship experience I've ever been in corporately was the Friday night of last year's pastor's conference. I've never been in anything like that, and I've been in some services. But uh, Michael Miller actually went to use the restroom before the Lord really filled that place with his presence. So he left the, the sanctuary, tried to come back in through like a side door, and when he opened the door, the power of God hit him, and he fell literally on his face, rug burned his forehead, and he left the pastor's conference, went home, with a nice rug burn for upper room as a souvenir. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me. I was actually gonna talk about this today. Maybe this would segue into the, the teaching this morning, which will be on the blood of Jesus. How many of you are grateful for the blood of Jesus? And um, I, I, I want this generation, uh, us as a people, uh, certainly me personally, to become more sensitive and aware of the presence of God. It's vital that we become more aware of the presence of the Lord. You know, um, as Bill said many times, when, uh, and I think this is so true and accurate, when they're training somebody to study counterfeit currency, they don't spend the majority of their time studying the counterfeit. They spend the majority of their time studying that which is real. And when the counterfeit is presented, it's pretty easy to discover. Amen? Pretty easy to recognize. And I found it amazing that at least in our environment, and I think the leadership team would agree and, and our worship team, it's been a sign to me that the songs with the most oil don't have or don't necessarily have the most views. Like if you have an antenna in your soul for the Lord's coming into a moment, I can tell you firsthand that views are not indicative of presence. It's not. I mean, when I look, it's, it's, it blows me away. When I look at that last night, I mean, I don't lose sleep over it. I just think it's interesting. So blowing, I mean, I'm not blown away by it. That's an exaggeration. Uh, <laughs> I am blown away that the Florida Gators won nationals for men's golf. Thank you, Lord. It's been a, it's been a long time, 22 years. So they won 22 years ago when I was four. I was four years old at the time. And, uh, yeah. All right, back to the scriptures. Hold on, or back to whatever I was doing. Um, that last night, I, what is that clip called? Welcome the king, welcome the king. It's interesting to me that we would all agree that that was the most glorious moment we'd ever have in God's presence and it has nowhere near the views where there was a lesser amount of glory and presence. And that tells me something, it tells me something about the church, it tells me something about this generation that certain things wow us that don't wow the Lord. 
certain things impress us that do not impress the Lord, the Lord endorses worship by his coming. Scripturally speaking, there's a way to know that God enjoyed the worship, biblically, and that needs to be our barometer. How many of you believe that? More than ever, we need preachers who walk up to the pulpit with their Bibles. Like, I could do it electronically. I'm not saying it's sinful, but I'm well aware of what I'm doing when I take this desk with the scriptures in hand. I realize that's speaking, and I don't ever want that to end flowing from this house. We believe the scriptures. Any, any, any sense of understanding the Lord outside the scriptures or belittling the scriptures in our quest to know the Lord is an assault from the pit of hell. In fact, Jesus, as you know, revealed himself to the disciples post-resurrection via the scriptures and the breaking of the body and blood of Jesus. And there he is standing in front of them. He could have just said, you don't need to turn to Moses, the law, and the Psalms. Just look at me. But if Jesus himself taught the scriptures post-resurrection, I think we need to teach the scriptures today. Say amen. Yes. All right, do you believe that? Yes. May we become more aware of the Lord's presence. May we listen to songs with our heart. May, we, may our values line up with the Lord's values. And may his presence be our obsession in worship. And may that be the litmus test. Amen? All right. To the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, take your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 14. You guys are all freaked out that we're going to Leviticus. Don't, don't be afraid. <laughs> One of our students, I don't know if she's here this morning, she was reading Leviticus for like, it seemed like an entire semester. Are you here? I don't know. Every time I'd pass by her at school, what are you reading? Because she'd sit in the hallway. Leviticus. And she'd serve in the parking lot, and she'd have her Bible open, which is beautiful, isn't it? And I'd say, are you reading Leviticus still? Two months ago, I'm in Leviticus. <laughs> so, Leviticus chapter 14. Verse 1. Holy Spirit, we don't need to ask you to bless your word, for your word is blessed. Your word is spirit and life. Now pierce us and speak to us. Open our eyes and anoint this moment that we would receive the bread of life in Jesus' name. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed, listen carefully now, two living and clean birds. Cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. I want you to underline that. Cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood, say the blood, of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times, say seven, on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. He who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes 
shave off all his hair, and wash himself in the water, that he may be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp and shall stay outside his tent seven days, but on the seventh day, he shall shave all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows. The Lord is meticulous. <laughs> he is a mysterious God. He shall shave off his eyebrows. All his hair he shall shave off. He shall wash his clothes, wash his body in water, and he shall be clean. Say thank you, Lord. All right. Now many of you are probably going, what in the world did I just read? Okay, according to Jesus, what is Leviticus about? Say Jesus. Jesus. All right. Specifically, Christ crucified and risen. We've talked about this many times. So that should eliminate a good portion of the intimidation here. Oh, no, I'm in Leviticus 14. I don't know what to do. Okay, what we do is we put on our Jesus glasses. All right, there's a fancy word for that. Uh, in theological circles, it's called a hermeneutic or the way I am going to look at something. So let's just say here, and it doesn't need to stay this way, but let's just say here, the meaning of Leviticus 14 is a bit hazy. Uh, you can't see very well right now. It's a little blurry. What does all of this mean? Well, the way to clarify your vision is to first put on your Jesus glasses. And you need to do that every morning. Every time you open the scripture, say, Holy Spirit, Jesus said, the scriptures speak of me. I believe that to be true because Jesus is the Lord himself. Since that is true, help me see him as he longs to be seen. Amen? So let's first look here at, at at uh, verse one, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. Number one, leprosy speaks of sin. In the New Testament, leprosy speaks of the sting and stain of sin. It is this outward disease that declares something. In fact, the leper himself had to declare this whenever he came around people, which could you imagine having to scream this? Unclean, unclean, unclean. Imagine how they felt about themselves. They had to be excluded from the Israeli community, and if they were around anybody who was clean, they had to scream unclean. All right? So when you read uh, Matthew chapter 8, and the healing of the leper, where the scripture says Jesus goes up the mountain in Matthew 5, right? Teaches Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which are the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. And the scripture says he comes down the mountain. So we, here we have a very hardworking Lord, a diligent Lord. There's nothing wrong with discipline. There's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with being dependable. You ready, Gen Z, for one? There's nothing wrong with faithfulness. There's nothing wrong with consistency. There's nothing wrong with being told where to go and when to be there by the Lord and by those in authority over us. This is part of being considered a faithful servant. So here's the Lord who chooses to walk up a mountain, not a hill but to go up a mountain and to teach three chapters of the greatest sermon ever uttered, many would say. Now, I love the whole Bible, but if I have to choose something, if, I'm gonna, if I want the Lord to use me to form Christ in people, I am going to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 very quickly. It's the Magna Carta, the constitution of the kingdom. Amen? It's who we are. And it's where many debates are settled. Should I do this or that? Well, uh, sometimes culture gets into our thinking or 
uh, maybe our own wisdom gets in and then you read something like this. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and speak all types of evil against you for my name's sake. These words are so heavenly and otherly that they align us instantly. If we come humbly. Does that make sense? Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are, these are supernatural words. And then you also have to look at the setting. You have to look at the symbolism. Jesus goes up a mountain to teach and to release this new law. In a way, he's saying, I'm the heavenly Moses. Moses is not the fulfillment. I'm not the type and shadow. Moses is the type and shadow. So now let me issue a new law. This is, in a sense, the heavenly Sinai. I am the divine law giver. Moses was just a servant. I'm about to establish something that's glorious and eternal. Which, by the way, does not nullify the power of what the Lord gave Moses. Because Jesus gave him that. <laughs> just want to make that clear. The Ten Commandments still matter. Because they came from the Lord. He actually wrote them with his finger. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. So, that being said, Jesus comes down that mountain after preaching. You try preaching three chapters. You'd be tired, especially if you climbed a mountain to, to even get to your pulpit. He comes back down the mountain, which is more demanding physically than going up one. Now, the last thing I feel like doing after preaching a sermon is going on a mountain climb. That was the last thing I'd want to do. I want to go to bed. So he comes down the mountain, and all of a sudden, he's met by a leper. Jesus had every right in the world to say, I'm too tired. I have nothing to give you. But something glorious happens in that passage. When he's met by the leper... The leper asks him a question, and I've preached this all over the world, because people need to know, yes, God can heal, but where most are stuck is on God's heart to heal. Does the Lord care about the healing physically, emotionally, and spiritually for his people? Does he really care? I mean, you can find people who, who don't even believe that God is doing this today, but they believe he's able. So his ability is not the question typically in the church. The question is, God's got a lot going on. Does he care about me? And does he want to heal me? That's the question that usually is at stake. And so the leper asked the Lord this question. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The leper is convinced of his ability because says, he says, you can do it. The question was around his willingness. You, if you are willing, I know you can do it. And I don't want to turn the text for the sake of time, but this blows me away. The Lord Jesus instantly says, I am willing. And if you read the text very slowly and carefully, he reaches out, the scripture says, and touches him and then prays. I am willing, be thou cleansed. Well, first he says, I'm willing, touches him and says, be thou cleansed. Why is that progression important? Because we see the Lord's desire, listen carefully now, to touch the untouchable and then pray for him. In other words, his hands beat his prayer to the punch. He couldn't help but touch the leper. Think of that. He did what nobody should do. He touched the skin of the unclean. So when you read Leviticus 14, and you look down, look down at your Bible. Verse 2, this shall be the law of the leper for his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. 
I know of a high priest who the leper came to. Yes, this speaks of physical healing, but it speaks of spiritual cleansing. It speaks of the cleansing of the soul as well. The Lord is in the cleansing business. The Lord cleanses the lepers still today. And prior to coming to Jesus, we all come as lepers. That's the first thing I want you to see there. Verse 3, and the priest, listen carefully, shall go out of the camp. Did Jesus die within the city gates of Jerusalem? No. Where did he die? Outside the camp. This is speaking of Jesus. You better give him praise. This is a masterful wisdom from the scriptures. The priest shall go outside the camp and the priest shall examine him. That's called conviction. Oh, some of you are. We didn't hand out melatonin at the door again, did we? Okay. (laughs) The priest shall examine him. That's what's going on when the Holy Spirit comes upon us to convict us. That's why, listen guys, listen carefully. That is why our standard must be so high regarding the purity of God in our own hearts personally and how we enter corporately to worship. Without the tangible glory of God, people don't feel his examining power. Without the clear preaching of the word, people don't understand that they are standing in the presence of a perfect God and they do not match up. See, the person being brought to the priest had a hunch that they had leprosy, but it was only until the priest declared their leprosy was it official. And the scripture says, the heart of men is deceitfully wicked. One of the, the, one I would say, one of the most consistent responses I bump into as we lead a school is this, and we have the best students in the world, and we've had an amazing year. But I'd say over the last five years, This has been the most consistent, when you really bring the scriptures to someone and say, hey, not judging you, but this is the scriptures. If they judge you, (laughs) that's on you. (laughs) If the shoe fits, like slide it on. But, you know, I'm not gonna hide behind that either. But if the scriptures say it, the scriptures win. No? This is just basic Christianity. The scriptures win. All right. Now, one of the most common responses I get is, well, I know my heart. And I go, oh, no, you don't. Let me turn to a chapter. I got a chapter and verse for you. (laughs) You alone know the hearts of men, O Lord. I (laughs) I don't know my heart unless, as David says, search me. Know me. I meditate on you in my heart in the night season. Why would David even lay down in the dark and say, search me? Because he refused to search himself. He knew that his own searching would not bring him to God's opinion. That's a humble approach. Back in the day, you get in an argument with someone, they go, you don't know me. You don't know me. (laughs) Now I'd say, and you don't know you either. (laughs) You alone know the hearts of men, O Lord. So the leper has to come to the priest to be examined. What I want to encourage you, this morning to do is this. Allow the scriptures and the presence of the Spirit to examine you. It's healthy. The priest has good intentions. He is the leper 
cleansing priest. He's the one who takes our uncleanliness his way and washes us and restores us and says, I am willing, be thou cleansed. And we leave rejoicing and washed, hopefully filled with hearts of repentance, and we can come into his presence without shame. It's wonderful. How many of you feel called to preach the gospel? All right, many of you. I want to give you a tip. Bring the leper to the priest. Don't bring them to your ministry. When we started, the Holy Spirit told me, Michael, if people walk in, this was in 2004, if people walk in knowing more about your ministry than Jesus, it's just proof you did not give the Holy Spirit the meeting. He knows how to do nothing but glorify Jesus. It's just what he does. It's like begging me to go play golf. I'm going to do it. You don't have to beg me long. It's the Holy Spirit's joy to glorify the Lord Jesus. It is what he does. Jesus said, he will testify of me. So that being said, when you're preaching, when you're leading something to the Lord in the store, when you're praying for the sick, yeah, our teams are, I love how we serve uh, elderly homes. And, and it just, because what is it about Western society that throws people away and just forgets about them? I'm not saying these places, these places are wonderful. That's why we're serving them. But I'm talking about from a family perspective. Let's just go put them in this place and visit them once every three years. That's not honor. I said, that's not honor. That's one of the plights of the church is that we don't honor fathers and mothers because they're no longer sexy enough for the pulpit. I'm sure Reb thinks he's super handsome. <laughs> and he is. But really, this is an issue. Honor, listen, we are a dishonorable generation on many fronts. In the old days, in the scripture, gray hair was considered a crown of glory. Mine are coming. But really, think about this. How we, how we construct our gatherings. Are they truly honorable? Are they really about Jesus? Or are they just becoming a platform for us to communicate why our ministries are vital? That is not bringing the leper to the priest. A faithful servant is a massive, he's an anointed usher. It's what we do. We are ushers. Whether you're a musician or a preacher, all you're really doing is going, here's the lamb. Our teams, when they're out there, as I said earlier, serving in the elderly community, what are they doing? Pointing people to Jesus. If we're in the hospitals, what can we do in the natural but point people to Jesus? If you've ever buried someone or walked somebody through death, what are you doing with the family as a pastor or, or, or just a Christian? What are you doing with the person who's about to go face the Lord, leading them to Jesus? Yes or no? What is good preaching? You're ushering people. You're bringing the leper to the priest. And if our teaching falls short of that, we've got a ways to go. Bring the leper to the priest so that the priest may examine the leper. Amen? The beautiful thing about this high priest is that he doesn't just announce your leprosy. He's in the cleansing business. He wants to liberate you. Say thank you, Jesus. All right, let's keep reading. Oh, this is about to get good. Put your mouthpieces in if you brought them. You might punch your neighbor. <laughs> this is going to get good. Verse 4, Then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop. Two living and clean birds. The death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. 
That's what I believe as I study the scriptures that these two birds symbolize. The death and burial, number one, and the resurrection of Jesus. His suffering and his glorification. You got to have both or there's no cleansing. See, people have their own version of Jesus. They have their own perspective of Jesus. They have their own uh, vision of Jesus. But when the scriptures determine that vision, you will find glory, listen carefully, in what the world rejects. Because John the apostle connects glory to the suffering Messiah. In fact, Jesus says to the Father in John's gospel, glorify me, and he's speaking of the cross. We, when we think of glory, we think of a shiny body. But to the Lord, glory looks like laying your life down. Can I take this out? Encourage me a little. To the Lord, glory looks like laying your life down. Do you know I've seen demons manifest at the sight of a cross? <laughs> at the very sight, I have seen demons screech and scream with fear at the sight of the cross. It's sad when demons can recognize glory more quickly than the church. Those two birds speak of the suffering Christ and the glorified Christ. All right. Now, let's look back down at our Bibles. Two clean birds, cedar wood. Say the cross. Oh, yeah. Scarlet speaks of the bloody Messiah or the suffering Christ. Well, what about hyssop? I've taught on this before. I believe hyssop speaks of faith. You say, why? Well, Look at Psalm 51, verse 7. Remember, the Bible answers the Bible. Psalm 51, verse 7. I'm having a blast this morning. I love this stuff. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, do you think David was speaking, when he says, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow, do you think he's speaking of his skin tone? Do you think he found a plant that made him less olive and more pasty? Like, did he find a plant that made him look less like me and more like court? Do you think this was a skin issue that the psalmist is writing about? And by the way, 80% of the psalms are written from David's tabernacle, which was a house of glory. So maybe, maybe David was being used to write spiritually. Imagine that, that the Psalms are spiritual. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Ah, we see hyssop here, bringing cleansing. Now, can you think of another verse or another passage in the Old Testament that speaks of hyssop? Can you think of a chapter maybe? Huh? Yeah, Exodus, what chapter? 12. All right. How did Moses apply the blood? In verse 22. Look down at it. My word, am I getting to the stage now where I need this? Cool glasses. <laughs> All right. Listen, look at verse 22. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. How is the blood applied in Exodus 12? With hyssop. Hold on. What does Paul teach that we are made righteous by? Faith. What is hyssop in New Testament teaching? Faith. How is the blood applied today? By faith. 
Hold on. Yeah, I, I know, I know. I didn't come up with it. It's just the Bible, but thank you. Now, you, you got to get this. I'm about to do a T.D. Jakes. Get ready, get ready, get ready. I'm not, all right, now listen. Listen. All right. What does Paul say? We believe, therefore we, we speak. So now we see the connection between faith and our testimony. Oh, I, 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 this isn't name it, claim it, word of faith. This is Bible teaching. All right. We see the connection between the faith in the heart and the declaration of our lips. Huh? Jesus said it like this. From the abundance of the, the mouth. All right. How do I know what's in your heart? Just talk to you for a while. Find out when you're having a bad day and go hang out with you. Because that's when all the good stuff comes out. <laughs> no, really. Find out. <laughs> oh. <sighs> all right. <laughs> I'm about to give it to you now. Find out when you're offended and go talk to you. Pick up a fence on you, if I really want to know you, and just go sit with you. Yeah. Find out when you're hurt and just go sit with you. I don't even need to go fix the problem. I'm just trying to know you. Find out when things didn't go your way or when you didn't get what you wanted. Now I have an opportunity to know you because character is tested when you're challenged. You want to watch people who have character? Study them in a season of challenge. See if their beliefs actually connect with this. And the way you'll know who they always were is by watching them in that offense. Because it's from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. The heart is a greenhouse. And it just takes challenge to create an exit for that which is in the greenhouse to flow out. And this is the exit door right here. Well, I just said that, but I didn't. I'm not. I know me. No, actually, you need to study what you said so that you can really know you and come to the priest so he can examine you. See, we don't understand the power of our confession. Confession is powerful. That's why we read the creeds here at every baptismal service. The creeds are read. And you feel the room start to change, don't you? When we say something like in, 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 in the, uh, in, 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 uh, well, in any of the creeds, I, I mean, gosh, I love the Nicene Creed. But when we read like a line like this, about the Holy Spirit. You are the Lord. The, we believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord, the giver of life. Something hits the room. Huh? He will return, speaking of Jesus, to judge the quick and the dead. Something hits the room. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, we believe in one God. Something hits the room. We believe in the Father, the Almighty. Something hits the room because of our declaration. And Jesus actually connects, listen to this, the faithfulness of our declaration to our eternity. You've got to have your non-negotiables. You've got to know where those lines are. Now, they may be different for everyone. Like, you know, I've watched some hills people are willing to die on, and I'm like, bro, that one's not that important. You know, like post-trib, preacher. I mean, people go at it over that. And I just watch and clap. Or on the charts from the book of Revelation. We love charts in America. I just love how someone actually thinks you can embody and encapsulate the entirety of this mysterious book that the fathers of the church even treaded lightly on to teach when they taught it. But we have our charts. And we sell them. <laughs> and if you disagree with my chart, you are a heathen. <laughs> okay, I won't die on those mountains. But you touch the lordship of Jesus, by dying on that mountain. You touch the deity of Jesus, I'm dying on that mountain. 
You touch on the Holy Spirit, whether or not he's God, I am dying on that mountain. You touch the blood of Jesus, we will die on that mountain. Amen? You touch the cross, we die on that mountain. You touch the resurrection, we die on that mountain. You touch the scriptures, we die on that mountain. Those are our lines, because we are believers. And Jesus connects the faithfulness of our confession to our, listen carefully, our eternity. You say, no, he, does. he absolutely does. If you deny me before men, I will deny you. Listen to this. Before the Father, take a moment here, before the Father and his holy angels. Have you ever seen an angel? You don't want to be denied in front of one. You don't want to be denied in front of the Father. You don't want to be denied, listen carefully, by the uncreated word himself at the throne as he looks at the Father and says, I don't know them. Actually, them is an inaccurate statement because you'll be there on your own. I don't know him. I don't know her. Father, they are a stranger to me. You don't want that. You see how when we preach too quickly or read our Bible too quickly, we don't, we're not even slow enough or prayerful enough to see with the eyes of our heart what that verse actually means. That one day in glory, standing on a sea of glass, mingled with fire. That's the flooring of the throne room. A sea. That's a big floor. Mingled with, with glass and fire. In the presence of the one who, if you behold, you can die. And here's Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, not because he's lesser than. Here's Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, who looks at his father, who he loves with all his heart, and says, I don't know him. It's a sobering thought. Then on the flip side, the Lord says, if you confess me, not think about me. Are you hearing me? He doesn't say if you just think kindly of me before men. If you know your own heart before men. No. Because Jesus understands. He instituted the truth. He embodies this. He knows it's from my heart that the mouth speaks. So if Jesus is saying, you will know a tree by its fruit, for from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, he's telling us how to know each other. Why would he do that? Because he embodies it. He never instructs us in an area that he doesn't embody. He is that. He speaks truth because he is truth. So it's true. So Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you or acknowledge you before the Father. That one looks a little different. That's Jesus going, Father, meet Jessica. She has an amazing husband. We'll get to him later. <laughs> He's already in, Lord. You already let him in. He got in eight spots before, before her. He's back on that golf course we built for him near the throne that looks somewhat like Augusta National. If there are any members from Augusta and you'd like to host me for the day, I'd love to come pray for you down, down the green pastures and lead me beside the still waters on 13th hole and I'll shepherd you right on through, right on through. But no, really, Jesus looks at the Father and says, this is Jessica. I want to acknowledge her. She acknowledged me with her mouth. Now I want to acknowledge her with my mouth. Imagine the voice that sounds like many waters saying, this is Jessica, Father. Confession is powerful. Don't you lose your confession. And you know how you lose your confession? By losing your heart. They're eternally tied to each other. We love your presence, Lord. 
So here we see, let's go back to Leviticus. I'll, I'll be done in a moment. Are you enjoying this? Yes. Here we see that hyssop. Oh, this is about to get so good. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Speaking of the cleansing capability of Calvary. What came forth from the Lord's side? Water and blood. What do we see initiated here in the Levitical code? Water and blood. What washes us today? The scriptures, that's what the scriptures teach, that the word washes us, calls it the washing of the word. Let's keep reading. As for the living bird, listen carefully, he shall take it, he being the priest, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and dip them and the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed. Now we see this holy, wonderful, explosive combination when it comes to rescuing the souls of men. Listen. The cross in the cedar wood. The blood of Jesus in the scarlet yarn, speaking of his suffering. The hyssop is the power of simple faith. You're putting all these together now and dipping, dipping that living bird into that. Listen to this now. And he, the priest, shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed. How many times did Jesus shed blood? Pastor Benny's talked about this. Here. How many times does the scriptures really recount? Recount seven. Luke 22, verse 44, he, he bleeds from his sweat in the Garden of Gethsemane. Isn't this wonderful that Jesus fulfills this Levitical code? Number two, he bleeds from his face. He's marred beyond recognition. That's Isaiah 56. I gave my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. In other words, he was brutalized in the face to the degree that his beard was plucked out and he was disfigured more than any man. He was marred beyond recognition that we would be recognizable at the throne. He bled from his face. Number three, he bled from his hands. Yes or no? Yes. Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked is all around me. They pierced my hands. Number four, he bled from his feet. Psalm twenty-two, sixteen. 16, they pierced my feet. This is awesome. Number five, they pierced his side and the church was birthed. Just like Eve came from, the Lord, uh, from Adam's side, so did the Eve of the last Adam, the, the wife of the last Adam. So was, was she birthed. That's us from the side of Jesus. Hallelujah. And that's John 19, 34. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and running water came out. Just read it to you in Leviticus 14. Gosh, I'd like to form tackle somebody right now. <laughs> I have problems. This is one of them. I... <sighs> Lastly, he bled from his head. Matthew 27, verse 29 and 30. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. He bleeds seven times, just as the blood is to be sprinkled seven times on the leper. And how many of you know the bleeding of Jesus has been sprinkled upon us, those who were once lepers. Oh, man. Do 
There's just one more thing I want to say. I don't know if I should say it because it may, may require more, more time. Next, well. I'm going to say it. And then you can just go chew it up. All right, go home and just dig into the scriptures yourself. Help me there, Joel, just real lightly. So, here's Jesus, the priest. Remember, he's offering and priest because he's all in all. So, he bleeds, leaves the camp of Israel, dies outside the gate, carrying across the cedar wood, bleeding as the wounded one, suffering as embodied, or I should say as typified in, in the red scarlet. And he is the source of our faith, embodied as the hyssop. And he leaves the camp. When the priest would take that dove, the living dove, and the dove or the bird would fly away, remember, it would fly away covered in water and blood. I want you to get the picture here. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Imagine this little bird being released. It's drenched in blood and water. And as it moves, it releases and sprinkles the camp or those outside the camp with blood and water. This is the work of the Lord. This is what the Holy Spirit does today. Because Jesus goes outside the camp, and eventually that bird flies outside the camp. Jesus calls his disciples to the world and to preach the gospel so that the Holy Spirit might sprinkle us with blood and cleanse us with his word. Isn't this just wonderful? Are you grateful for the blood of Jesus this morning? I want to leave you with this regarding our confession and the belief of our heart in the blood. I read this last week, Revelation chapter 12. They overcame. Listen carefully. Don't miss this. Do not miss this with nobody moving. The accuser of the brethren is working overtime right now against the church. It's just what he does. More than ever, we need our testimony to connect with the blood. Again, I'm giving you scripture. I don't want you to pick up some tradition from me that's not in the scriptures. But Revelation 12 teaches us that they overcame the accuser by the blood of the lamb. Now here's the connection. And the word of our testimony. Hallelujah. Accusation against your life is destroyed by your testimony of the blood. And that's why Paul writes, shall depth, shall height, shall wit, shall power, shall principalities. In other words, if every angel, fallen and righteous, if every saint, if every person who went to hell, every person who is in heaven, every elder, if each one of them stood before the throne and declared you guilty, after you've been washed by the blood, God wouldn't listen to a single syllable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood destroys the accusation of the accuser when we connect the blood to our testimony. And may we have no other testimony than Christ has overcome, that he bled and died and he is alive today. Amen? Amen. I'd like everyone to stand, please. Come on, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Now, every head bowed and eye closed, please. 
with nobody moving. I feel in my heart there are many, many in the room this morning who, who don't feel worthy to be in this room. In fact, many of you feel this even on a weekly basis. Maybe there are young people here who, who are with their parents or their grandparents. Maybe you didn't even want to be here. And part of the reason you didn't want to be here is because of sin that makes you feel shameful when you walk in. And maybe there are others who've lived this life that is a mountaintop and a valley life. You, maybe you go a month feeling wonderful. Or you go another month feeling broken. You, 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 you leave the presence of the Lord. You don't feel righteous. Maybe it's because, just listen, maybe it's because you've tried to cleanse yourself. Maybe it's because, in actuality, you have tried to become your own savior. Friend, listen to me. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is leading you to the priest this morning. His name is Jesus. And while you're sitting there in your seat, the Holy Ghost is examining you. And all of us, every one of us, all of us under the light of God before we were washed by the precious blood of Jesus, the examination and its verdict for every single one of us is you are a leper. We are unclean. That is our testimony. But I'm here to tell you this morning, based on the promises of the word of the living God, that he honors above his own name, the scripture says. The name of Jesus is precious. But the scripture says God will honor his word above his own name. And what I can tell you with 100% confidence this morning in the character and word of God is this. That if you come to him this morning, he will by no means turn you away. He will not reject you if you come to him in your brokenness. You may come to him and your heart might be screaming, I am unclean. I am dirty. I am sinful. The Lord will look at you this morning and say, I am willing. I am willing. Be cleansed. But friend, that won't, that opportunity doesn't last forever. One day, as the Noah's Ark's door shut, so too the opportunity for grace will shut and it will be too late. And the Bible says many will call on the Lord, but he will not hear them. This morning is your moment. The Bible says, it doesn't say today is the day of salvation. It says now, now, now is the day of salvation. Maybe you say, I, I know Jesus, but you're bound in sin. This is for you too. Get free this morning. Maybe you've left the wonder of a loving relationship with the Lord and, and you're not walking in that beautiful fire anymore and you want to. You want to come back home. I want you to lift your hand. If you're one of those three, in any of those three categories, lift your hand. If you raised your hand or wish you did, I want you to get down here. Run down here right now before we take communion. Come down. Come down from the balcony. Many, many hands went up. Good. Come. Come. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give the Lord praise. Come. Come. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church. Give the Lord praise. Come on. I want to celebrate like they do in heaven. I want to build a reputation that we rejoice in what the Lord rejoices in. Teams, come out. Come out. I want them surrounded. I want a hand on everyone's shoulder. God bless you. Come, come. Joe and Amy, can you pray for this, this precious couple here? Thank you, Father. The Lord is pleased. The Lord is pleased. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to begin praying. And I just, I, I hear that verse in my heart right now. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice who's warring in your soul and you care more about what people think in this room or who you're with, Break out of that. Do not deny the Lord. Come, come. I'm not trying to get more people to the altar. I am trying to get more people to heaven. That is my heart. And I, I just want to encourage you. Break out of that fear. God bless you. God bless you. Break out of that. It doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't matter. 
If there's somebody next to you, just say, excuse me. I need, yeah, God bless you. I'll wait, I'll wait. The Lord's waiting. You just say, I, if you have to go on your own, come on your own. You're not going to be on your own once you get down here. The Lord's waiting for you. Yeah, Amy, thank you. Hallelujah. I'm going to begin praying. And when I do, if there's any more, you just come. You will not interrupt me. There's room at the cross. Hallelujah. Oh, let's just lift our hands, all of us. Can we all pray this out loud? Heavenly Father, I offer my life to you. I have sinned against you. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Forgive my sin. Today I repent. I turn from the world. I turn from my own sin. I renounce the devil himself. And I give all of my heart to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, I believe and I declare that you are God Almighty, that you were born of the Virgin, lived a perfect and holy life, that you suffered and died, and that you were buried. Three days later, you were raised from the dead, and you are alive, and today you are seated at the right hand of the Father, and you are coming back again to rule and reign. Find me ready, Lord. Receive me as I receive you. Be my everything. Wash me that I might be whiter than snow. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. May I have a booklet? Thank you. For those of you, just remain standing, everyone. For those of you who came forward, would you just look at me for one second? It's, it's beautiful to see what the Lord's doing in you all. All of you have one of these. This is not a way to get you to join the church, okay? We would love for you to join the church. But I told our team, our focus is not keeping people in this church. Our focus needs to be to disciple people in Christ. That should be our focus. Now, in this booklet, there are keys that the Bible teaches to live a strong and victorious Christian life. You do not need to live a single moment defeated. It doesn't mean you're not gonna screw up. It just means that while you lose a battle, the Lord wins the war. You do not need to live in seasons of backsliding, in seasons of habitual sin. That is not what the Bible promises. I've said this many times, uh, 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 a preacher of the gospel once said this, if we need to wait until we're dead to be free from our sinful habits, then death has become our savior and Jesus is not. You can be free. Number one, and this is all in this booklet, I'm gonna ask that you keep it, and then uh, when service is over after communion, that you meet our team at the information booth in the lobby. It's very important because we wanna get you water baptized, and on a journey of discipleship. Number one, read your Bible every day. Okay, it's vital. It is living bread and living food. Number two, pray every day. You say, I don't know how. He will teach you. It's very simple. You go into your room and spend time with the Lord. Pray the scriptures if you don't know where to start. Just take your Bible out and begin to pray the scriptures from your heart. Number three, you need to be water baptized. It's a powerful encounter with God. It's a severing from the world and an entire generation, the scripture says. It's vital that you're baptized in water and we would love to do that here. I think we do it every six, six weeks. We'd love to do that here. Number five, or what, what, what number was that? Three? Okay, whatever. Next, <laughs> next, you need to become a part of a people, the body of Christ. You need to worship the Lord together, receive the sacraments together, sit under the teaching of the word together. It's called church. And we would love to serve you here. If God doesn't call you here, may the Lord send you somewhere where the Bible is taught with clarity, where people value family, and where the Holy Spirit is free to move. That's my prayer for you, okay? Lastly, oh no, there's two more. Next, I'm gonna pray it now, that the Lord come upon you in power. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Court, Court and uh, Sabata, would you guys pray for them too? Yeah. 
May the Lord come upon you in power today. And we're going to pray that in just a moment before we take communion. Next, you need to share Jesus with somebody else, and I want it to start today. I'm asking you that before you get out of this parking lot, that you will at least send someone a text that says this, I found Jesus today. Or you could say, he found me, whatever you want to say. That would be more proper. He found me, and I responded to his love. I want you to know him too. I'm going to ask you to do that today before you leave the property. Amen? All right. Church, would you stretch your hands? I want all of us in the seats just to, just to pray in the spirit. And I'm going to pray that the Father, the giver of this wonderful gift, would release the power of the Holy Ghost upon you. Can you pick up those keys just a little? Pick them up just a bit. It's beautiful. Pray in the spirit, church. Father, you promised your people the gift of the Spirit, the clothing, the empowerment, the precious and filling of the Spirit. And I pray now in the name of Jesus that the blessed presence of the Holy Spirit come upon these people. Everyone at the altar, may they know your touch. May they know your power. May they know your cleansing. May they know your fire. You said, we shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Fill your people, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Use them to be witnesses. You said, Lord, that we would receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon us to be witnesses. Make them witnesses. Now, church, we all need more. Father, from front to back, Fill every vessel in this house, everyone watching, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. May your power come upon us in Jesus' name. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be blessed in the presence of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, can we give the Lord praise? <laughs> Team, would you help everybody up? Let's give the Lord praise. Would you help them back to their seats, please? Can we all rejoice? This is wonderful. Pastor Paul, would you come? Can we get Rev a mic? We're going to ready for communion now, so let's just remain standing. Uh, I'm going to have Pastor... Can we bring the elements in, please? We do it a little more like St. Paul now, Rev. If the team could just bring the, usher, or the uh, elements, I'm going to have Pastor Paul pray. Thank you, Lord. Praise Heavenly you. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, Father. Lord, we come before your throne as a broken people, Lord. If we're honest with ourselves, Lord, we, we've sinned against you in our thoughts, yes, Lord. in our words, in our actions. There's things we've done, things we shouldn't have done, things where we've been remiss, Lord, and neglected. But yet, in the midst of these failings, Lord, uh, there's the blood. Thank you, Lord. Of Jesus Christ, Lord. And as we heard this morning, the blood of Christ that washes and cleanses away all sin, Lord. And it's not just a mystery or a miracle, but it's personal, Lord, for each of us. Mm. So, Lord, we, we open our heart to you now and we confess our sin. Just take a moment in silence and... Go before the Lord and say, Lord, I failed you I, in my thoughts, in my words, in my deeds. And, and I'm sorry. I'm heartily sorry from my heart. It's not a, an intellectual experience here. It's, it's a heart experience. Go into your heart and cleanse it by confessing the sin. And ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and to lead you, to empower you, to embrace the, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was broken that by his stripes would be healed. Every stripe, every place in his body, in his hands, in his feet, in his head, his back, in every place he endured those stripes Amen. for one purpose, and that was for our healing. Amen. Healing in our minds, where those strongholds get a grip, the fear and the anxiety and the worry and the fretting. In our hearts, where there's brokenness, a violation of trust, where people have 
hurt us, wounded us. But it's not only a healing of our mind and our heart, but our bodies. The illnesses and, and the plaguing diseases and the horrific infirmities that come against us. Jesus endured those stripes for our healing in our mind, our heart, our bodies, Amen. and our relationships. Amen. He can heal the marriages, those fractured relationships with children or relatives or Amen. colleagues at work or Amen. peers. The healing of Christ endured in his body was for us. But in the blood, he gives us spiritual redemption. And on the day when we cross that threshold, when we breathe our last, when our hearts fail, when our eyes dim and we die, we know that we will live forever because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, Lord, for the word from Michael this morning that says Jesus, when he sees you as his precious redeemed, he will say, I know you. Mm. Lord, we can know Jesus Christ, but there's that possibility that he doesn't know us. And I just think of Matthew chapter 7, where the people stood before him and said, Jesus, I know you. And he said, who are you? Who are you? What a horrible thing when Jesus Christ on the other side of the grave looks at us and says, who are you? Lord, we want to be known. Don't you want to be known by Christ? Yes. You're known through his blood and through your faith. And so we come to receive the sacrament of communion, the immortal presence of Jesus Christ, not just symbolically, but as a moment when the immortal Amen. God engages your mortal body for healing and continued redemption. This is a precious, sacred moment. When Jesus said in John chapter 6, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, and there were those among him that said, this is too hard, Lord. We don't understand that. And a little later in that chapter, there, there were many that followed him that turned away because they couldn't understand the depth of that mystery. But Lord, in this moment, we receive the mystery of your redemptive power through your blood and the broken body for Amen. our healing. We receive it with great joy Amen. and we receive it in faith. So Lord, thank you for the body which was broken for us. We thank you that on that night when you celebrated the Passover with your disciples, you said, this is my body broken for you as often as you eat this, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it. He said, drink, this cup is the new promise, the new covenant in my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you eat this, as often as you drink this, remember me. So, Lord, we celebrate now. Yes. We receive the body of yes. Christ broken. Remember so take the body of Christ Right now, take it. They're going to come up and get it. Oh, right? they're going to, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. When you come up, I really felt as, as Rev was praying, come up in faith as you receive the elements, and then you go back to your seat with your family, receive them in a prayerful state. I believe the Lord will heal many of you and set many of you free. So ushers, if you could, and uh, worship team, could you come up, please, and just lead us? You're free to release the rose ushers. Once you've received communion, may the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tonight at 6 p.m. Don't skip communion. I mean, my word. Amen. Do not skip communion this morning. And come in faith tonight. It will be a glorious time together. Guys, Michael here from Jesus Image in Orlando, Florida. We are so excited to be coming to the West Coast of America, specifically California, and we really believe this is the Lord and that He is about to move in great power and glory in America. And it's an honor for us to be part of that storyline. That being said, we want to broadcast these incredible meetings to the world. As you know, the Lord has really blessed 
uh, the media ministry here at Jesus Image. We have an amazing team, but at the end of the day, we all know and are aware of the fact that it is the Holy Spirit. We need a separate system to broadcast the Jesus Tour and our other events on the road. The cost of that is $350,000. And so I'm asking all of you to pray and to deeply consider being a part of helping us see the nations tune in to the move of the Holy Spirit on the West Coast. So would you pray about sowing a seed and walking in generosity? I know the Lord will bless you for it as we give back to Him what He's already given us for the sake and glory of His name. Years ago, we felt our hearts burning for a place that would invite wholehearted, devoted lovers of Jesus to come sit at His feet and to hear His voice. What the Lord is doing at Jesus School is just so special. There's really nothing like it. It's like your eyes open and you see Jesus in a way that you've never known Him before. We've seen miracles, we've seen people born again, we've seen people set free. We've seen worship go up in the most beautiful way as Jesus is being adored. And it's the presence of Jesus and the presence of Jesus alone that changes lives. What makes Jesus School so special and so unique is it really is all about Jesus. It's the simplicity of loving Him and being with Him. It truly transforms your life. There is absolutely no substitute for the presence of the Lord Jesus. And that's what Jesus School is. It is a house for His glory and a people who love Him with everything in their hearts. When you lay all the other things down, lay them at His feet, and when you just want Him, you will never be the same.